Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to the final keynote of BCC 2020. Uh, so I'm very excited to announce the, uh, to introduce the final speaker. Uh, so this will be Abby Kabunok Mays, and Abby, I really hope I said your name right then. Um, so actually, I did a couple of talks about open source community a couple of days ago, but Abby is probably one of the people who's been most foundational in helping me. Uh, get there and learn a lot of these community skills. So I'm really looking forward to watching her next talk. Uh, so to give you a little bit of intro about Abby. Uh, so she leads the Mozilla's developer-focused, trustworthy AI strategy around uh, MozFest and open source. Previously, she founded Open Leaders, uh, sorry, Mozilla Open Leaders, which was a program that's worked with over 600 open projects globally. With a background in open source and community organizing, she is fueling a culture of openness in research and innovation. Prior to joining Mozilla, Abby worked as a bioinformatics software developer at OICR and at Michigan State University, a bit tongue-tied there, sorry, <laughs> where she applied open source to research problems. She's been named in 100 Awesome Women in Open Source by Sourced and is a current and past member of a variety of committees and editorial boards, including the Journal of Open Source Software, the Open Source Systems Conference, and the Mozilla Open Source Support Awards. Uh, so the talk that Abby will be giving is Bias by Default, Exploring Discrimination in Research Code. And Abby, over to you when you're ready. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, let's see if I can figure, remember how to share my slides. We practiced this just now. There we go. <laughs> And you did say my name correctly, yo. I really appreciate it. Good job. <laughs> well, well, it is such an honor to be here. Uh, huge thanks to all the organizers. Um, and yeah, it's nice to see a lot of my past colleagues from OICR. Um, and <laughs> it's nice to see Malvika saying hi in the chat. If you want to say hi in the chat, I will say hi back to you. But uh, today I do want to explore the effects, both of our code, um, but also of the diversity in this room. So. This is a um, pretty heavy topic, but we are seeing this big wave of racial justice work happening. A lot of it was sparked by the brutal murder of George Floyd, um, but I am excited to see us like lean into this problem of racial justice and see what it means um, for us as a research community, um, but also worldwide. So as part of my learning in this space, I did join a book club. Uh, we are reading How to Be Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. And I feel like I should mention, I did join the Bosque Social last night, um, and I did sit at the books table, but I didn't talk about this book. I haven't gotten very far yet, but what I have read has been really impactful on me. Um, so I'm sorry I didn't discuss this book with all the people at the books table last night. But one of the big takeaways from this, from the first part that I read at least, is um, that the opposite of racist isn't anti-racist, or sorry, the opposite of racist isn't not racist, but anti-racist. And so this idea that if you go through the world just being neutral or just not being racist, you're still implicitly supporting a lot of the structures that disproportionately benefit a specific group of people. And I think this is an idea we're starting to see around this ethical AI conversation too. So um, two weeks ago, Patricia Kalori from Stanford and the co-creator of the Radical AI Network um, published this nature commentary piece where she says, many researchers think that AI is neutral and often beneficial, marred only by biased data drawn from an unfair society. In reality, an indifferent field serves the powerful. So it's that same idea that AI, just considering itself being neutral, really still supports a lot of the bias that happens in society. Yeah. And I'm not the first person to um, see this connection. Uh, Karen Howe talks about it in her newsletter there at the bottom, the violence of neutrality um, from the algorithm. So today I want to sort of explore this idea of um, yeah, shifting power in the tech that we're building. So we're going to talk about three things. Uh, the first is um, looking at a few examples of how bias in code is affecting diversity in science and how diversity in science really is affecting bias in code. Uh, second, we'll talk about how tech ethics is not new. and I feel like I don't need to tell this audience this. Um, it's been exciting to see uh, like ethics come up in all the keynotes so far from like all the time it takes to work with an IRB uh, to the Hippocratic Oath for Scientists with uh, Pratchett's talk yesterday. And then finally, what I'm excited to talk to you about is uh, how open source practices can really shift power. 
So first one, bias and code and how that affects diversity in science and then vice versa. Um, so the, I actually gave a version of this talk about a year ago. And it, back a year ago, if you did a Google image search for scientists on Google, you would see like predominantly white researchers because um, it is, yeah, that is the bias in the training data. And by doing this, it made it harder for underrepresented groups to sort of get into research. They don't see themselves represented. And it really amplified a lot of bias. And I will say I did this search again about almost exactly a year later. Um, and I think it, it got a little bit better. Uh, this is the new set. And I don't know if this was a difference in the data. People are just publishing more images with uh, more diverse scientists um, or if it was a change in the algorithm. But I think it is showing how small tweaks in the tech that we're building can affect people in the future. So the next example I have is uh, from Kathy O'Neill's book, uh, The Weapons of Mass Destruction, where she talks about uh, the college ranking system. And in 1983, US News um, started this opinion survey where they ranked the colleges in the world. And they got a lot of complaints that it was unfair. People thought that it was, um, oh, <laughs> people thought that uh, it was biased. It was just people's opinions. So what they did in 1988, they put together an algorithm to sort of measure this. So they measured things like SAT scores, student teacher ratios, acceptance rates, graduation rates, alumni contributions. And by making it an algorithm and just using hard data, suddenly this was seen as much more fair than before. Um, and your ranking in the system actually had real life effects. So if you fell in the rankings, colleges would, they'd lose their reputation. Uh, conditions would slowly deteriorate. Students and professors would start to avoid that school. And then the rankings would plummet even further. And what was interesting in this book, she talks about how in 2014, uh, Saudi Arabia's King Abdulaziz University, their math department, suddenly showed up in seventh place. And it was a newer department. And on the surface, that looks great. Like a new school can like make it high in this algorithm or in this, uh, this listing. And when they looked closer, they saw that the school had contacted uh, really highly cited mathematicians, offered each of them $72,000 to serve as adjunct faculty for three weeks a year. They put them up in a five-star hotel. <laughs> and in return, they would just ask that the researchers have changed their affiliation on the Thomson Reuters academic citation website. So they had really gained the algorithm. They figured out how to like, shoot up to seventh place. Um, and it was really affecting the real world. So after I heard this story, I actually thought of, um, thought of impact factor, which has affected a lot of people in this room. Um, and there's, I found this article from over 20 years ago, uh, why the impact factor of journals should not be used for evaluating research. But it's a similar situation where it's, it's measured, it's measuring data, it's an algorithm that's doing the ranking, but it has real world effects around where people are want to publish and people's actual careers are really affected by this. So those are some examples of how um, algorithms or code just really affects diversity in the real world. Um, but there's this great quote from Stephen Merity. He's a machine learning researcher. In 2017, he said, uh, bias is not just in our data sets, it's in our conferences and community. And one of the, one of the best, I don't know, my favorite anecdotes around why this is important um, it's actually a story told by Kathy Pham. She's a, a senior fellow with, um, with Mozilla, and she runs the Responsible Computer Science Challenge. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but she runs this weekly group that's very interdisciplinary. Uh, they have people from CS, law, history, race and gender studies. And someone from a software company, a large software company, came one week and talked to them about an idea that their company was thinking of implementing. So they were considering using Google Street View to uh, give a safety rating to different areas. Um, that way people can feel safer being uh, like going to a different area. And um, the group, they had a really short conversation, maybe only 10 minutes. Um, someone brought up the idea like, oh, have you heard of the broken windows theory? And this idea that when the police, when police are looking at the number of broken windows in a neighborhood, um, and using that to decide they're policing, it really becomes problematic. They have a policing problem. And it's a well-researched phenomenon. And like the, res the engineer hadn't heard this at all. Um, and then someone else asked, oh, but who, who is this safe for? Um, if someone might feel safer in that right image than they would in the left and vice versa. And it's interesting because 
The engineer, they had talked to their team and they all thought this was a great idea to provide a safety rating. Um, and they were ready to start implementing it. But then by just having a really quick 10 minute conversation with a more interdisciplinary group, um, they, they learned so much about the potential effects of this technology. So I think that it shows how important it is to have these diverse groups or to have these kind of um, water cooler conversations with different groups and not just with, um, like with that same group of engineers who all think like you. So the last example I'll share in this section. Um, this was going around Twitter about a month ago, uh, but it was the face depixelizer. The animated GIF isn't working right now. That's OK. But you would, you would give the algorithm a low, uh, a low res image, and then it would output a high res image. And people quickly found out that if you gave it an image of a person of color, it would output a white person. So there's an example of Obama there. And like this is problematic. So then we saw this conversation come up. It was a pretty long Twitter conversation. This is just one screenshot uh, between Tim Gebrier, she's the co-lead of Google's ethical AI work, and Yan McCunn, he's Facebook's chief AI scientist. And Yan was really saying like, oh, that happens because of bias data set. Um, that's, that's what happens. And Yan really called him out for really erasing the deeper roots of this problem. It's not just that there was a biased data set, but like, why was that data set chosen? Why were certain decisions made? And this conversation um, between trying to fix it with technology alone, it's a bio, uh, you have a biased data set, maybe you can use math to fix that versus looking at the systemic reasons why that data set happened in the first place. Um, I've heard this being called as the second wave of algorithmic accountability. So here's a blog from Frank Pasquale, and it really talks about that first wave, um, really focused on improving that existing system or fixing the bias with math or just techno solutioneering, really. Um, whereas this next wave is saying, like, why does this happen in the first place? And back to that first quote, just saying because AI thinks of itself as neutral, it really is amplifying some of the bigger problems. So like, how can technology really shift power instead? So that leads us to tech ethics is not new. And yeah, we've already talked about it quite a bit in this meeting. Um, but I do love this work from Casey Fiesler. Uh, she's from the University of Colorado. And um, she was sick and tired of people saying that oh, we don't have any ethics courses for computer science, or like engineers never have to take ethics courses. Well, computer engineers don't have to take ethics courses. Um, so she crowdsourced this list of uh, 197 courses from 188 universities. And a lot of these courses have been going on for decades. So these, this work exists, and people are thinking about this. Um, the problem is it's often an optional course, or it's considered a fluff class, and people aren't taking it. So it, it's there. People are thinking of it. And um, I ran into this uh, algorithmic accountability bingo sheet from Marenke Wieringa. Um, they read 160 articles on algorithmic accountability in FedML <laughs> and then came up with this bingo card afterwards. And I don't know if you can see my mouse. Oh, you can't. But if you can see in the middle right bottom, there's call for ethical classes for data scientists or engineers is one of them. A lot of people have been calling for that. Um, Another one, not to throw a branch under the bus, but there's a Hippocratic Oath for Data Science is being called for there. And I know I've given, um, I've given a talk that called for this too. I also talked about self-driving cars. And then in the top right is a technological solutionism, which is that first wave of algorithmic accountability, I think. So I just thought this was a fun bingo card to include. All right, so this is the third section I'm excited about. Um, it's really thinking about how open source practices can shift power. And just before going into that, I do want to say that code is power. If you're writing code, you have so much power. I know you might feel like you're just a lowly grad student or a lowly postdoc, um, but what you're building affects so much in society and affects so much in your lab even. Um, and if Marvel has taught me anything, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, I, just, I like this photo, it's really cute. 
But um, on Friday, I caught a little bit of the Participatory Approaches to Machine Learning uh, conference, and uh, Jamel Watson Daniel from Data for Black Lives presented this slide, and I thought it was so perfect. I just put the whole slide in here. But she really talks about these different power imbalances in machine learning. And she lists all these things the technical community has control over. First is what data is being collected, what data is used for training, how much to reveal about training data sets, choosing models to be applied to data, interpreting models and model outputs, assessment and verification of models, deployment of algorithms based on models. And I'd say even past this, you make a lot of choices around how much weight you should give one variable, or what language are you gonna choose, or where will this be, like what system are you gonna use, or where this will be stored. Um, there's so many choices that have real effects down the line um, that you have so much power of, in, yeah, as the builders. So I'd recommend you check out her talk if you're at all interested in this. Um, but what I wanted to share is like, I do think that working open or these different open source practices can be a great way to shift power. And I was so excited about this. I tweeted this slide yesterday just because I was really excited about this idea. But one of my favorite definitions of working open is that it's both public and it's participatory. So this requires structuring efforts so that outsiders can meaningfully participate and become insiders as appropriate. And I'm glad that so many of you are already using open source software and making open source software and really see the power in that. And I wanna extend that in, in terms of this broader conversation around power by inviting those traditionally excluded from shaping tech to become insiders in your work, you are shifting power. Um, it just doesn't work if you're only inviting people who already have power. And I will say this is much harder to do than inviting the regular collaborators you work with. Um, it's much easier to collaborate with someone who has a computer science degree, who already understands everything you're talking about. But if you wanna have a broader perspective and if you wanna shift power, you have to put a lot more effort into making your work more inviting to people who aren't normally represented. So I do want to talk through five open source practices that can shift power. And I normally talk about these in terms of community interactions. So these are five different ways you can interact with your community and build something better than you would have otherwise. Um, but I want to introduce these to you as ways to shift power. So this was a study that um, Mozilla did with the Copenhagen Institute for Interaction Design a few years ago. And they, they made these lovely diagrams. So the first is uh, giving, and uh, many of you write your open source software and give it away. So no strings attached, giving of valued products or services. So the example from the study is that uh, Google Android gifted their development platform to encourage new uses by developers. And yeah, there's a lot of advantages to working openly like this. Um, it incentivizes adoption by giving it away for free. If you're trying to drive a standard by giving away um, a use for free, it really helps helps with adoption of a standard. Um, and you get improved products and services if you have more people using it and giving you feedback. Um, but if you're sh using this to shift power, really ask yourself, like, who does not have access to your work who should have? And I know a lot of times your work is publicly available online, and everyone could technically come and try to find it. Um, but sometimes the people who should have that access, they don't know where to look, or they don't understand where to find it. So even just intentionally giving your work to someone who really needs it, I think can be really powerful and help shift that power. Um, and then the next two are about listening. So this first one is more active listening, so soliciting ideas. Um, it's about using a community to generate ideas and solutions. And the example from the study is uh, about the Lego Ideas platform, which I didn't know about before, but apparently you can propose any type of Lego kit that you want Lego to make. And if enough people vote for it, they'll actually make that kit, uh, which is really cool. And uh, I, I have so many Lego ideas, I probably should propose some of them. But open advantages, you understand your community better, um, and you have additional offerings that were generated by your community. In terms of shifting power, are there marginalized groups you can be listening to that may be affected by your work? I know a lot of you are working on research software, and it might not be immediately evident who gets affected by this. Um, but thinking downstream, or just thinking out of the box, who might possibly be affected, and then getting their feedback on this. And then are there experts from other fields, social science, race and gender studies uh, that you can listen to? Are there people who know things about stuff like the broken windows theory? Um, yeah, that might bring up ideas that you hadn't thought of or concerns that you hadn't thought of. 
So I know it's harder to reach out to people not like you, but you can try listening to them. And then the more passive view of listening is learning through use. So collecting and analyzing activity uh, to improve products or services. And the example they have there is uh, the Spotify Discover. Um, I actually really like Spotify and it knows my listening habits. So then it generates this uh, personalized playlist for me every week. And um, I, I like it. <laughs> um, so open advantages, you understand your users better, you can improve your products and you can fail fast. If you can see something's not working, uh, you can try something else. But in terms of shifting your power or shifting power, um, it might, this might be a good way to learn how marginalized groups are using your software and seeing if there's anything you can do to make it easy for them. And just a general caveat in this one, um, I know I, I often get a lot of questions about privacy on this. And obviously, um, get data from people with consent and also be trustworthy, like have, make sure people understand why you're using their data and uh, that it's actually helpful for them. And yeah, don't sell it. Um, and then the last two are around collaborating, two different ways uh, you can collaborate with others. First is creating together, which is like the classic open source, creating with a group, um, but share the tasks and costs of achieving a pre-established goals. And the example I have is Local Motors, uh, which invites designers to use an online shared database of parts to co-develop products. And I'm sure many of you have seen with the different open source projects you're running, uh, that you have a better product in the end, you lower operating costs, um, and you give ownership to the community. And I think even just watching how Boss gives a run, um, or like BCC entirely, um, how, yeah, I think this is true for that. You have so many volunteers working on this together, um, and the community really feels like that they own it because you have, you have so much community running it. But in terms of shifting power, I think this is the hardest place to really invite outsiders into your work. Um, but who should be part of building this but is not? Is there someone you think who should be helping? Um, and can you invite experts from other fields to build this with you? And like I said, it's, if someone doesn't know how to code, it might be much harder to invite them in. Um, but if you, you can create pathways that make it easier so that they can be part of this discussion um, and, and they can be part of shaping what it is you're making. And then this last, uh, last one is around networking common interests. Uh, so this is coordinating to ensure that individual activities achieve more towards a shared mission. So this is instead of just a, a project creating together, it's like many projects that have a shared interest, sort of seeing their aligned potential and then working together. A uh, sort of like Galaxy and Bus, just seeing that you have this shared goal and what can you do to do things together um, and learn from each other. So the example in the study was around Ashoka. Uh, which is a, a platform for innovators that share an overall objective that each has their own different projects. So the open advantage, you advance the common playing fields by working together, um, separate groups can help each other, lowering operating costs, and you can improve products by learning from partners. And then in terms of shifting power, this one's maybe more sharing power, but are there aligned projects you can partner with and share power and really lift each other up? So as a summary, here are those five open source practices that can shift power. I hope this helps spark some ideas of where you can invite others into your work. Um, but I think now we can go to table view for five minutes. Can someone pop up and confirm that we can still do this? I forgot to confirm this. Um, okay, should be fine. Yes, this is good. So, awesome. So um, just in your tables, um, think about these two questions. One, where can you include others and share power in your work? And then two, who will you include? Is there someone from a marginalized community or some other expert that uh, you think should be, their voice should be heard here? So we'll give you five minutes in your tables and then I guess we'll show back, show up back here in five. Okay. 